my name is Lauren Spear and you're watching the HorrorFam.com podcast. Today, my guest is author Jim Harberson. <laughs> how you doing, Jim? Good, how are you? I'm doing all right. It's been a while since I've done this, so I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm happy to have you on as the guest for episode 21. <laughs> Thank you, happy to be here. And Jim, you're an author in the horror genre. Would you like to tell everyone a little bit about what you do? I know that you sent me a uh, comorbidities, and you've also done graphic novels and a whole bunch of other stuff, but I'm sure you can tell everyone better than I can. Well, I I write primarily horror, though I've done some I've done some comedy stuff. I started out writing fiction in earnest about. 11 years ago, and I started out writing crime and comedy and then moved into horror. I wrote several several screenplays with a friend of mine, and one of those ended up becoming my first published book, um, the graphic novel Stay Alive. And it's, you know, it, it's difficult for me to conceive of horror without some kind of comic tinge because the real world is a pretty horrifying place and sort of just just retailing horror without some kind of comedy relief doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm partial to horror comedies myself. <laughs> yeah. So so what if you my my you know stay alive is a horror comedy. It's very dark but it's comedy. Um it's about a the premise is that there's a um a new website called youthkill.com that's the most popular in the world. It allows anyone anywhere to nominate anyone anywhere uh, to be murdered. Mm. And the, the purveyors of the website put every nominee to a popular vote. And whoever wins, they in turn murder that person. Oh. And so this down on her luck starlet in Hollywood gets herself voted to the top of the list by spoiling a a uh, the home run of a terminally ill kid with cancer at mm. a professional baseball game by tagging him out dressed as the opposing team's mascot at home plate mm. and you know that it's one of those things where they set up the home run so the kid can run the bases and everybody's cheering <laughs> she crashes the party Oops. anyway <laughs> so she ends up starring in a reality show called Stay Alive, in which she tries to avoid being murdered by the You Kill people. Okay. Um, and one of the people to add to the to add to the mix, the people in charge of You Kill free the her stalker. I'm sure most you know a lot of actors and actresses in Hollywood have stalkers, and so they they free a stalker who has murdered is in prison for life for murdering um for murdering two of her co-stars on her last film Mm -hmm. and so he's in the background hunting her as well um okay this seems to be kind of a theme with your work i noticed that um at least two of the stories in comorbidities uh take place in hollywood yeah (laughs) i've always been fascinated by celebrity and the culture that surrounds celebrity Mm-hmm. Um, because it's in 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 some ways it, it's also contrived, but at the same time it's expressive of really really fundamental human human needs and desires. Mm-hmm. And I've always been I've I've always been fascinated by the way people construct fake realities around mm-hmm. other people and or and or themselves. Yeah, and the willingness of people to participate in this. And the desire of so many people to be at the center of it, mm. and so yeah, I, I, I go back to that idea again and again. This idea of personality as being possibly your own worst enemy, right? Um, because if I, I'm a believer in the idea that if you give people exactly what they want, they'll be they'll be miserable. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> They can't account. They they are people are generally unable to account for things that they really want outside of 
perhaps at a really general level, like most people want to be healthy. You know, they, they don't want to be, they, they want to have a job, say, that isn't absolutely horrifying. But mm -hmm. outside of vagaries, like, or, you know, sort of essential things like that, most people, I think, you know, they, they will choose something that is, that occurs at the expense of a lot of other essential things. And so there's a, a warping effect on the reality that you experience. Mm -hmm. And that warping is, you know, increased by people who are helping you, you know, create an image of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we, we live, we live in an age of images and, and sound bites and memes and increasingly alternate realities in, in social media and cyberspace. And, you know, think of all the people who post photos of themselves that are hopelessly filtered so that you, you can't really tell who the person is. Right. Yeah. And it's it's like a, a whole different reality. Um, and people are increasingly are just, you know, retreating into this reality because it's apparently preferable to the real world. The metaphysical is preferable to the physical. Huh. And <laughs> that is, in and uh, of, I'm feeling, sorry. you know, this is touching on a lot of things for me, like, um, we had to keep pushing this um, interview back because I took on a very intense job to, um, you know, get the funds to get a webcam. But then because of the job, I didn't have time to do the interview. <laughs> so even though I had the equipment, it's like, it's like I have exactly what I want and no time to do it. <laughs> it's just so if you're, what you just said touched me in that way as well. And also I'm wearing a wig right now, so I'm a little bit fake right now as well. <laughs> so it's, you know. It's some relatable topics you touched on. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's ironic, right? I mean, so much of human existence is is tinged with irony, mm -hmm. um, because it, we're we're limited in our ability to appreciate things, and most people never want to admit that. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's it's probably a survival instinct. You don't want to admit when you're wrong. Um, <laughs> part of it's vanity. Part of it's pride, but part of it is showing, you know, conceding that you're wrong, let's say, about something is a sign of weakness, potentially, that people mm -hmm. will people will seize upon, even if you do it in good faith. I mean, that's why, for example, politicians more or less never admit they're wrong. Mm. They always try to, you know, spin something or blame something else. And it's uh, I was talking to a friend of mine today who's a lawyer. I used to be a lawyer. Oh, wow. And, and <laughs> we were talking about, you know, the ability, you know, how people will reframe questions, issues, concepts to the point where it's almost unrecognizable so that it's hard. The expression I used it, you turn a, a shit sandwich into a double cheeseburger, right? Oh, yeah. Um, because you, know, you just you find ways to parse the meaning of terms and ideas to a point where you introduce ambiguity even if there really is an ambiguity <laughs> and you know that's how that's how people function in our society especially in a society where people deal more in in symbols and and meta reality than in reality there is a famous cultural critic named grail marcus and I grew up in the age of MTV in the 80s, and he had this wonderful description of MTV, which was basically, a, it was it was wall-to-wall -wall music videos for the most part. I, it's not anymore, but it was no. <laughs> from its yeah. inception for about eight years, and he described it as the pornography of semiotics, mm. which was really interesting because, you know, if you think about it, it's just symbols manipulated for, <clears throat> excuse me, entertainment and crass to serve crass or to appease crass desires. And so I when I when I look at horror, I, I I look at people and their desires to do things to have power, for example, over other people, and try to think of ways that, you know, this can be exploited into something horrifying. For, you know, the idea of a of a maniac hunting people down, I mean, yeah, it's scary, but it's been done to death, so to speak. Um, 
it's much more interesting to me to see how people's good intentions can become terrible things or mm -hmm. produce terrible things. So, for example, um, one of my stories is more sci-fi horror than anything. At the end of my collection, it's called um, it. It's called Peak Bliss, and the premise is, is that in the future, human beings' <clears throat> lives are co controlled completely by supposedly benevolent artificial intelligences, and their lives are so perfectly curated that they never interact with any other living being because that is an opportunity for distress, right? Mm. Not, they can't even have pets because pets will die. So they have AI pets instead. Yeah. And the story is about a guy who's qu quietly going mad because of this. And finally, one day he discovers that he's dead to joy and resolves to kill himself. And the AIs intervene and have a you know, conversation with him and tell him that it's okay. He's experiencing what's called peak bliss, which means that the the dopamine receptors or whatever in his brain that is responsible for pleasurable sensation have been burned out. And hmm. all they have to do is blank his memory and he'll be able to experience pleasure again, right? Yeah. <laughs> which is, of course, insane. But it, it's the idea of, you know, you take logical ideas, or scientific ones, and you extend them to, you extend them to a logical extreme that is aberrant. So one of my favorite movies recently is Captain America, the Winter Soldier, the one in which it's revealed that Hydra has taken over S.H.I.E.L.D. and Captain America is, is a fugitive from S.H.I.E.L.D., which is high. Spoilers. <laughs> yeah. But there's this wonderful scene in which Nick Fury, formerly the head of S.H.I.E.L.D., mm -hmm. confronts uh, Robert Redford, who's the head of Hydra, who's also sort of the head of S.H.I.E.L.D. too. Yeah. And Robert Redford says, you know, would you kill 20 million people to save a billion? Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, if you think in terms of if your highest goal is protecting human life, and that's above all other goals, then, and you could do it if you could wipe out lots of potentially dangerous people. You could save a lot of lives. But at the same time, that think about what that represents. And so Robert Redford's character says, um, I have the courage to do that. And, and, and the old Nick Fury would have the courage to do that too. And Nick Fury replies, well, I have the courage not to do it. And so you take the idea of protecting human life, but you pervert it out of context with other equally important values, and you end up guilty of mass murder, right? Yeah. So, and that, that's the kind of thing that interests me. Um, okay. So, for example, my, my new, one of the, the stories in my, my collection of novellas comorbidities mm -hmm. it's called cat problem and yep you got a lot of problems in this one cat problem ghost problems <laughs> yeah well <laughs> the idea is what would happen if the if the military came up with an eco-friendly weapon of mass destruction mm -hmm. um and in this case what they do is they 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 weaponize a bunch of feral cats with a special strain of rabies contagious only to cats and they use the it turns the cats into killing machines and they end up eating a small town in Colorado as a test. And yeah, I was I was just thinking that you know there there are ways in which people will do terrible things to serve. In this case, the goal is to serve is to to the the mastermind, the Pentagon official who's the mastermind behind this wants to put put a use to cats who would otherwise be disposable mm -hmm. to make them less disposable if if only because they're more useful to mm -hmm. some end but also um to serve an environmental agenda right and you know nobody dis you know that these are both you know good intentions right mm -hmm. to you know to in one sense 
say feral cats. I mean, I'm a vegan and I love animals, so mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I'm particularly attuned to issues like that and to protect the earth. But, you know, what are good, what are good justifications for your action become the premises for it, for terrible things, right? So, yeah. and so there's a, there's a kind of irony built into there that the, you're trying to protect a human life, animal life, you're trying to protect the earth and you end up doing terrible things, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, you know, there's a famous political philosopher, theologian named Reinhold Niebuhr. He wrote this wonderful book called The Irony of American History. And he talked about the fact, and I doubt he was the first person to observe this, that, you know, we develop nuclear weapons to protect ourselves. And so we're sitting on this massive arsenal of things that could eradicate all life on Earth, ironically, to protect life. On Earth. So, and human beings, especially in the United States, are kind of allergic to irony that people would like to think that their motives are true. And I mean, unless they're just openly corrupt, in which case, you know, I, I, I far prefer people who are openly corrupt to those who have deluded themselves into thinking that doing bad things is somehow the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have this, you have this contradiction in which supposedly the good things people are doing, or I'm sorry, the good people are doing things that are reprehensible, but because the right people are doing them, it must be right. So, which, you know, in some ways is really horrific. And that's horror to me. And so what you do is you take a, you take things that are expected to be good or wholesome or decent, and you produce terrible things with them. Mm -hmm. And there, one of my stories, I think it's me again in my second collection is about a supermodel who's recovering from plastic surgery at some Swiss hospital. And she sees herself on television at the same time, live mm. or recently. And, and it's her, but, you know, it can't be her because she's reco recuperating from this yeah. surgery. Mm. And it turns mm. out, long story short, that this weirdo billionaire who was who was um, creeping on her bought her genetic profile that she you know this is something a lot of people have their ge genetic profiles analyzed so they can find out where they are or who they're who they are where they're from etc health issues and this yeah. is very useful information but it's also susceptible to bad to abuses and so I was thinking, what would happen if a billionaire bought your, was perving, perving on you, bought your genetic profile, and was able to clone you, mm. right? Yeah. And so what happens is this billionaire clones her a bunch of times, but determines that the real thing is what he really wants. And so he abducts her. Um, and I, I'll, I'll leave the details to the reader, but, <laughs> you know, uh, there's this, this sense, people want to, People want to live in a kind of romantic distance from reality. I, I think it's the human condition. And I think that that tendency is, is, is where I like to find horror. Because it's inevitable that bad things will happen. Yeah. Um, it's inevitable that things will be distorted. And so the only question is how far and by whom and to what end. So... Um, Okay. I'm, go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry. So some of your influences were uh, comic books and um, movies, and um, you also mentioned your past career as a lawyer. Has Did that come into play at, at any point? Like, have you ever found yourself using um, your, your former life as a lawyer in your writing? Yes. Yes? Uh, my experience... <laughs> I was a criminal defense and civil rights lawyer, so I saw a lot of bad things happening to people. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> society, society had sort of written off. Yeah. And they're still human beings, but... Yeah, but America they get treated like the feral cats. <laughs> right. Americans yeah. have a terrible tendency to write you off if you're undesirable or not even a criminal, if you're just accused of a crime. 
right? Mm -hmm. And I, I remember I had a case once in which my client was in jail awaiting trial disposition of his case. And he'd been bitten by a brown recluse spider. Oh, wow. And he also had a staph infection. He'd almost died like mm -hmm. twice in custody. And so I moved to have him released. And I was telling, I mean, he came to court and he was bright red and feverish. I mean, it was horrifying. I saw the injury to his neck. Yeah. But that's where he'd been bitten. That's where the staph infection was. And I remember telling this really green prosecutor about this. And, you know, this is supposedly a well-educated, circumspect person who so you has, were you were defense, yes, like yeah, like Phoenix, yeah. like Phoenix, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I could never do anything besides defense, and it's okay. just not in me to prosecute people. Okay. And I was telling this junior prosecutor, she, she, I think she was just really out of law school, and and I told her that about that this was terrible, right? Response: mm -hmm. Well, that's why you don't go to jail. You know, I, I was just like, what? You know, but that 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 it was almost insouciant, and I think that that typifies. You know, it's hard to blame her because I doubt she had that much life experience, and the culture I we were operating in, she was reflecting that culture. But you know, as soon as it becomes easy to put people in a box and forget about them, bad things start to happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, once you see that up close. Unless you're immune to empathy, mm -hmm. you know, it can't help but change you. So that and, you know, seeing that really amplified my sensibilities about about horror. Like mm -hmm. I said, I like slasher films. Right. I used to. I, I've seen so many now. It is, it's sort of old hat for me. But at the same time, they're not that scary to me. The way here's a good example. There's a movie that Michael Bay made that came out in 2005 called The Island. I don't know oh, if you yeah. saw it. <laughs> yeah, I <It's> did. A... <laughs> and I like to say it's the best movie about the, the Holocaust, the Nazi Holocaust. Ever oh, made. wow. <laughs> in some ways, because the way the clones are treated in that, they're, they're abject dehumanization. And the portrayal of that is. You know, it's absolutely horrifying. It's as horrifying as any as any Holocaust film you'd want to see. I, the the two things that the two things that come to mind. There's a scene where this woman clone is being used as a, a surrogate mother for an infertile couple, mm -hmm. and she gives birth to the baby. She wants to see it, and what happens is the baby is spirited away and handed to the couple that that bought it essentially yeah and in the meantime the mother who's crying out to see her child is quietly euthanized murdered mm. really in her yeah. hospital bed the nurse just gives her a shot in her iv and kills her oh wow. you know <laughs> and this is juxtaposed with the with the parents uh loving their new child mm -hmm. and there's a there's another scene i think it's um Who's the actor who was the the who had the magical powers in the Green Mile? I'm trying to remember his name. He died young. He was really oh, sad. Um, Michael Clark Duncan. He, yeah, he he's a, he was a great actor, and there was this wonderful scene where, as a clone, he realizes he's about to have his organs harvested, and he's fighting very hard not to be not to be harvested, and he fails, and mm -hmm. you can see the horror in his in his eyes, and and. What's really interesting, the reason I say it's maybe the best, one of the, my fa it's favorite is a hard word, most effective movie that I've seen about the Holocaust. I say that because it takes the, the essential horror of what happened and what happens in any kind of mass murder, genocide, and it makes it as pungent as it could possibly be, it decontextualizes it so that you're seeing it again for the first time in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you see something enough, you become immune to it. It's it's like there's a theory in 
there's a theory in uh, psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. <laughs> and the premise is, is that if you expose yourself to something you fear enough, you your mind becomes deadened to it. You're no longer afraid of it. Yeah, I and, went through a lot of that when I was getting treated for PTSD. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I hope it worked. Yeah, um, for the most part. <laughs> but, you know, so if you see things, if you see violence, for example, films of violence, real violence even, eventually you become... It, you know, not immune to them, but it, it, the, the power, they lose their power over you. Yeah. And, but if you see the same terrible thing reframed in a way that has stripped away your ability to ignore it, then that is really, really powerful. And so what I often try to do, and I try to do this with humor because otherwise it would just be too much. Mm -hmm. I try to find ways of Re-examining things that scare people, but ways that are unexpected, um, and to take assumptions people might make without really thinking, you know, assumptions they'll make, you know, often without even realizing they're making an assumption, and use it as a way to to bring the horror back to them in a in an essential and ir sort of unignorable way and that's why i raised the the story of the island um, yeah. <laughs> because it, it really you know it, it really it, it had such an effect on me and that's why i said it was such a great movie basically about the holocaust or hotel rwanda or pick your pick your terrible genocide horrible mass murder you know um it was so effective, I think, in part because it took the same act actions that you would see in that in the political context and put them in a depoliticized context. So you weren't. So you're you're think you were startled by what it was in mm -hmm. a way you weren't prepared for it. You know, if, if you watch a movie about, say, the Holocaust or Hotel Rwanda or Pick Your Poison any other terrible thing, Stalin's purges, whole pot. You're prepared because you, you probably know about what you're getting into. You're prepared yeah. for that. So you're prepared to see films of mass graves, let's say, or other atrocities. I wasn't at least prepared when I saw the island. And, and you know, and that's why in, in some ways it was so effective because it, it decontextualized the same acts and made you see them in a in a in a raw way that made the horror they represent or they constitute uh, more powerful, more effective than would presenting them in in an another context. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's just I was just thinking I need to rewatch The Island. I haven't seen it since it was in theaters. And then when it went to DVD, I was working at the warehouse and a woman asked me if it was appropriate for her teenager to watch. And she's like, I don't care about violence, but is there any sex in it? And I said, yes, but it's kind of like the sex scene in Top Gun, except it's orange instead of blue. Yeah. <laughs> and that's basically what I remember. <laughs> so it's like, geez, the island had a lot more going on than I thought. I should probably go rewatch that. <laughs> yeah. So you take terrible things in human history, and those are the things that scare me the most. Mm -hmm. Political violence, the ability of mobs to justify terrible things to themselves. Um, you know, and it happened, it's happened throughout history. Mm -hmm. um, there were reports of during the Middle Ages, people, and, and there's a scene like this in that Mel Gibson movie, The Patriot, where during the Middle Ages in Europe, uh, Christians would surround synagogues where the, where the, um, the, the Jew, Jewish people were praying, having services inside, and they would lock the doors and burn them down, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you think about that. What what would cause a large group of people to be okay with that? And what, that's that's endlessly interesting to me. I think that there's there's a tendency of 
people um, want to, it's like the, uh, there's a quote in the Federalist, the Federalist Papers by Madison about the mobs. He said, even if every Athenian citizen had been a Socrates, Socrates being, of course, the ultimate gadfly, the ultimate contrarian, uh, every Athenian assembly would still be a mob. And, you know, if you get a critical mass of people together, it's like that wonderful quote from The Simpsons, there's no justice quite like mob justice. You get this weird moral unanimity and bad things happen, right? So I went to, I went to parochial school growing up and I saw this, this idea that, you know, well, God's on our side, so, you know, you're wrong. Even if you're right, you're wrong. It's uh, it's very strange and disturbing. And it's part of the human condition because people desperately want a sense of security. They want life to have meaning. They want a happy ending. And people who sincerely believe something different, they see as an existential threat to their own sense of reality, I think. Um, and so they have to be destroyed, right? Um, because there, there's no middle ground. There's, there's no harmony. I mean, one of the great things about the modern world, and it gets a lot of flack, is that it, it teaches people tolerance and, and it teaches people the idea of living peaceably with people you might strongly disagree with for a larger goal. And it comes out of, it's an attempt to repudiate things like wars of religion and other sectarian thinking, but I think I, I sometimes wonder if most people are capable of that. You know, even the smartest, most well-educated people—they just—they need re, they need the world to make sense. They need the universe to have a purpose, and if it doesn't, they can't handle it. So they, you know, they find religion in one thing or another. It may not even—it may not be a, a traditional religious outlook. It might be a political thing or dedication to consumer brands or sports teams, but it's religion because it's it's at some fundamental point insusceptible to reason and reasonable conversation. It's mm -hmm. you either agree with me or you're my enemy, right? Um, Just... So, yeah, what, and what do you do with that? That Just... and Sometimes I just like to have fun too. I wrote a story in Cat Problem is sort of like that. But I wrote another story where the in a discussing supermarket of death, my second book, it's a collection of short stories. Um, and in it, it's about this undertaker to the stars, this this mortician who is preferred to take care of dead celebrities. And one night he gets a visit from this weirdo lawyer who offers him $100,000 so his client can have his way with this beautiful dead celebrity who took too much, I don't know, if it was like heroin and cocaine, like a speedball. And so what happens is, is that he says, okay, $100,000. And the lawyer starts coming back to him with all these other clients. And, you know, so this guy is making all this money. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he's cutting other people in. And the, the, the middle scene involves essentially an orgy at the county morgue where all these rich weirdos come in to have their way with the dead skaters from a traveling uh, themed skating show called Sparkling Secrets. <laughs> And they end up murdering a couple of people who might otherwise not be able to be bribed and force the mortician to clean the whole thing up. And when the mortician protests, the, the, the lawyer says, it's not like you have clean hands. This whole thing is a disgusting supermarket of death and we're paying you to deal with it. So just take the money and deal with it. You know, um, I'm not sure that there's any grander you know, rumination on ideas and that. It's just, I thought it would be a fun story to tell. You know, uh, one of my influences, my essential influence in many ways, were the EC comics of the 1950s, the ones that came under fire and helped precipitate the comics code. 
Yeah, and actually, um, I think I've got just a second. <laughs> <laughs> Love those too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tales from the Crypt, Weird Science, all that stuff. And mm. it, it, it just, I read them when I was 14. I, I read the horror titles when I was about 14, and it was like a bomb went off in my head. It was just so, 14, 15, it was so great. And it set the model for my writing of short stories where. You know, I try to I try to tell a terrible tale humorously with a twist ending as much as possible. And the story I, I, I've mentioned before, one of my favorites was the the EC would do their own t- take on grim fairy fairy tales. Mm-hmm. And the they their take on Hansel and Gretel involved Hansel and Gretel actually getting eaten at the end of the story. They go into the oven and and the witch looks at the reader. They break the fourth wall and says, you didn't think Hansel and Gretel were going to escape, did you? This is an <laughs> EC magazine, you know? Like, yeah. shame on you for thinking there'd be a happy ending. You knew what you were getting into. Yeah. You knew what this was. The bottom yeah. expression, you know, which is great. Uh, so, you know, and and obviously it was too much for... It was too much for the um, for the people in power in the early fifties, and it got comic books were essentially blamed for all, not all, but juvenile delinquency. And mm-hmm. then the Red Scare got worked into it, and you know, I'm just glad they were able to get away with what they were doing for five years, and they were able to generate so much stuff. Um, and there's a lot of easy comics. Yeah. Um, that and Mad Magazine. Mad Magazine, which I read long before I read EC Comics, um, mm-hmm. was an essential. It was probably the most, it was probably more important to my education than almost all of my formal education because it taught me to view the world from a kind of cynical, not depressed, but, you know, kind of world weary way of. You know, the world is a fucked up place. Pardon the expression. The best you can do is make jokes about it. Or as I like to say, put on the, you know, Christian St. Paul says, put on the armor of light. I I like to say, put on the armor of irony. Mm -hmm. Because it's a way to, it's a way to deal with, with the horrible vicissitudes of life. It it gives you a distance. So, you know, it's not too painful. You know, there, there's a tendency I think a lot of people want the world to conform to their desires, you know, and it, 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 it never will, not consistently enough. And if it did, it would be like that Twilight Zone episode where the, the little, the 12 year old kid has an entire town hostage to his whims because he can yeah. wish anything he wants. Uh, Anthony. Yeah. And, you know, that's terrible things happen when they like said, when, you know, the world can look like what you want it. Terrible things happen. So, you know, it's better to just seal yourself against it and not take it personally. Because if you do, the world will eat you alive. It really will. If you take it personally, forget it. So you'll you'll either go mad or you'll become a tyrant seeking power to um, control for risk even. I think that there was this Batman... This Batman story that came out recently, I think the author's name is Scott Snyder, and it was called Last Night on Earth. I hope I'm not, I hope I'm getting the story details straight, but basically what happens is the Earth is, long story short, the the Earth is put in a post-apocalyptic posture. And one of of the ways it's being enslaved is by a suit, a clone of of Bruce Wayne that Bruce Wayne created. He tried to create a Batman in perpetuity to protect people, but it ends up being a terrible thing, a dictatorial presence that enslaves everyone to abolish all crime. Because he doesn't have the same life experiences that would make him empathetic, right? Right. He's not human in Mm -hmm. a way. So 
right and and so it's you're you're right and it's a perversion of a desire to say protect people mm-hmm. but you know that is taken out of context of taken out of context of other human values and made the only value mm-hmm. it's what you know saint augustine referred to sin as misordered love you take a you take something that's good and you pervert it mm-hmm. so that it's out of out of sync with the rest of with the rest of uh, other virtues or mm-hmm. other virtues. Um, and uh, another one of my favorite films, another essential influence on my work was A Clockwork Orange, mm-hmm. uh, Stanley Kubrick's movie, in mm-hmm. which this horrible juvenile delinquent who was guilty of hom- homicide and all mm-hmm. kinds of other crimes, um, multiple homicides, at least two, Mm-hmm. is put through this thing called the Ludovico technique in which he's forced to watch terrible films things you know, CBT like, um, yeah exactly <laughs> but he's given drugs so that anytime he has either a, a sexual or a violent urge he, he gets physically ill mm-hmm. uh, so he's his own nervous system prevents him from acting on you know wrong urges mm-hmm. uh, and it's a, it's a, it's funny because the only person who protests this is the Anglican cleric in the film who says, "What about choice?" And the government pooh poohs that. It's like we have to deal with crime. Choice is a luxury, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, people set up ways of managing reality, and if it if they become convinced, compelling enough, you know, we just we start doing terrible things, right? Mm-hmm. So that, like I said, I'm kind of repeating myself. That is where I like to find horror. There's a there's a story I wrote. There's a story in my story collection called OCD, and it's about a guy with OCD. He lives as a recluse, and he's constantly afraid people will think he's committed crimes that he hasn't committed. And what happens is one day his mail carrier makes a joke that he has a mass grave in his basement because the guy gets all these, the guy is, lives alone. He's a, he's a product quality assurance tester. So he tests all kinds of products. He gets all this mail all the time. That's how he knows his letter carrier so well. Mm-hmm. And the guy becomes convinced that the letter carrier thinks he actually does have a mass grave in his book. So he murders the letter carrier. And he uh, already has set up in his house a means of disposing of the body because he realized someday he might have to murder somebody who thought that he might have committed a crime that he didn't commit. Oh, wow. And uh-huh. from there, it spirals out into a series of murders that the guy commits in order to cover up the murder that he committed to because he was afraid he was going to be accused of a murder he never committed. <laughs> um, so it, it's played for comic effect, and the guy ends up murdering, I don't know, five people or something. Oops. <laughs> um, yeah. And <laughs> at the end of the story, he's driving around in the ice cream truck whose driver he murdered in order to cover <laughs> up another murder. And he's got all the bodies in the truck because it's a freezer truck, right? Mm-hmm. And he's serving ice cream to children and he's finally gotten out and, you know, he's not a recluse anymore. He's out driving around, dealing with the public and he calls his therapist. And his therapist is overjoyed that his clients made this breakthrough. But he's like, oh, but there's a catch, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, it's like uh, it's like solving problems in the wrong way or doing the the wrong thing for the right reason. Mm-hmm. I've always I've always loved those conundra, so um, because it it's it it's it's a moral confusion and it's it's a complicated it's a complicated thing for for many people to deal with. So you know, like I said, there there's it presents an opportunity for people to do the do terrible things and think they're doing the right thing. Um, and, oh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead. So, A Disgusting Supermarket of Death was your short story collection, and 
Stay Alive was your, was that your first graphic novel or just one of your graphic That was my first graphic novel. And my they were first, go ahead. They were both nominated for Rondo Awards, right? Yes, Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Awards, which okay. I'm greatly appreciative of. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. <laughs> So my my first actually my first foray into pub, my first published horror piece was a webcomic that you can find on my website. It's just jamesharberson.com. And it's called Death Cat. Oh. <laughs> and it's yeah, it's a cat. It cat. had very very similar to this, right? Did you work yeah, with the well, same artist or I've used the same artist for all the art done for my projects. His name's Stephen Baskerville, and he's wonderfully talented. In fact, okay. he just, the, the, the Royal Post Office, he's British, the Royal Post Office commissioned him with two other artists to produce stamps commemorating the uh, Hasbro's Transformers. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And so he, he helped produce those stamps. They just got released on September 1st. Oh, um, congratulations to him. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's great. Um, and you can, you can get to his site through by clicking on his name on my website. Okay. And so my co-author, Fraser Rice, with whom I did the graphic novel, he, he was writing under a pseudonym at, at that time, Mackie Wildwood. We, we, we took a, a, a piece out of, uh, a screenplay we'd written and it was the, the idea came from this. There was a, I guess that. People who are dying in pheromones that are attractive to cats. Mm. And I don't know what it is, if it's ringing the dinner bell, who knows. But somebody in some hospice, I think, or retirement home in Rhode Island discovered that, hey, the, the palliative care cat is glomming onto the people who are about to, about to die. You know, that's yeah. kind of weird. And so I was thinking, there's got to be a horror story here, right? Yeah. A comedy horror story. And so what we did was we put together this mini comic, this mini, this, an EC story, essentially, mm-hmm. called Death Cat. And yeah. in it, there's a cat, a palliative care cat named Bingo. And he's notorious for glomming on the people about to die. And so the, the sick people in the, in the home are terrified of him. Yeah. And so what the staff are doing is, they take wagers on who he'll pick, and then they shut the cat in the sick room and wait for him to pick a, a victim. Right. So they're betting on who who Bingo is going to foretell the death of. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll leave it to the, the potential reader to follow through to the end. But, you know, it's that's a good example of my sensibility. It's like, let's take something horrible and not take away the horror of it, but make it palatable by making it funny. So, um, and therefore you can, you can deal with the horror without, you know, being utterly put off. It's like a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are plenty of, there are plenty of horror films from the 70s, let's say, Mm-hmm. that are abs- the grindhouse films that in many ways they're just they're they're better off being trailers you, you know how during the in 2006 or 7 6 um Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez came out with those grindhouse films Planet right. Terror and Death Proof and the and they trailers had, in between right the the fake mm-hmm. trailers mm-hmm. except one of them Mach- Machete became a real movie yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of these movies would be better off as these kinds of trailers because they're just, you're just variations on a theme. But, you know, there's a movie called Blood Sucking Freaks that an attorney I worked with said was designed to test the boundaries of the First Amendment. That is an utterly, it's just, or cannibal, cannibal, uh, what is it? Cannibal is it Holocaust. Dia? Yeah. These movies yeah, are those just, were both on the last season of uh, Joe Bob's Last Drive-In. Yeah, they're essentially pornographic, and it's it's difficult to watch them because there's no 
there's not a lot of redeeming artistic value. I mean, just showing terrible things happening is. It gets boring. <laughs> yeah. But, and, you know, add to that in Cannibal Holocaust, the, the, the actual slaughter of the turtles, you know, mm -hmm. which, you know, they actually yeah. kill animals to make a movie. Really? Yeah. Are you kidding me? I think even Rob Zombie won't watch that movie because of that. Um, he's a vegan, I think. But, you know, it, to me, there's, you know, those movies in context were transgressive and they were trying to be transgressive in the 70s in order to fight the, the, the prevailing culture. But now they what kids won. today would call try hard. <laughs> yeah. But now it's not. It's not transgressive anymore. Right. So. <laughs> You know, you really have to be doing something else. It can't just be about graphic violence because, you know, I, I guess you can watch one of those movies once, but unless you have a literally a prurient interest in it, you know, it, it's just not that interesting. So, and I'm not advocating censorship or anything. I just don't, as artistically speaking, these movies don't interest me. So, mm. um, In any event, um, and well, I'll, I'll, some of them are guilty pleasures, okay? Mm -hmm. um, for example, I'm trying to think. The, the classic example of this is I Spit on Your Grave, mm -hmm. which is Great a great title. <laughs> yeah, a grotesque movie to watch, but you can't help but feel a visceral, visceral sense of satisfaction watching the victim, the, the protagonist in that movie, get her revenge on her attackers, right? So I would actually argue that that movie is the most feminist movie ever made. Um, and, you know, it's one of those movies where it, it sort of, it takes it to the very edge of what's acceptable while still being artistically redeeming. Uh, Some people you... totally... Totally if you disagree. ever want to write an article for horrorfam.com about why that's so, I would love to I would love to read that. <laughs> well, I think that thank you, but I think that, you know, this isn't an original idea. I think that the director himself and other other critics because it's attracted a lot of critical commentary have said the same thing. It's, you know, it it works especially in context because it's a feminist film, it that dimension redeems the gratuit. It makes the violence somehow less gratuitous. Mm -hmm. The the rape and the violence less gratuitous. I mean, it's still gratuitous. There's no getting around that. You don't have to show that level of detail. Um, the I'm sure that the director would argue otherwise. And it's one of those things where it's you know it's debatable, but. Uh, simply showing things like those faces of death movies, though I guess a lot of that's fake. You know, it, it's, you know, if you're just watching it to be transgressive, that's one thing. But if, you know, outside of, say, doing something transgressive in order to call attention to a societal restriction on expression that you don't like, you know, outside of that context, it's, it's not very interesting. Like you said, it's boring. I saw this interview once with uh, Suze Randall, who was a, a she, I don't know if she's re retired. I think she is. Her daughter, Holly, is a, they're, they're boudoir, they're, they're adult filmmakers, photographers. And Suze Randall, I saw her in this documentary about Hustler years ago. And she said that, she not only photographed her, and she did. She had her own explicit pictorial done, um, which was really interesting. I mean, she's willing to go there, so she's not just photographing it. She's willing to be that, and you know, I salute her. That's real commitment to your art form. Uh, the most striking thing she discussed, though, was that as the trans, the war, the transgressive war against moral standards. Uh, continued and they won again and again and again, it became less interesting. Mm -hmm. Until finally, it wasn't interesting at all because you could do whatever you wanted, essentially. And who is it that said that art dies without rules or without uh, something to, to fight up, back up against? I think there's something to that. You have to have rules. Otherwise, 
Otherwise, it's just not that interesting, right? I mean, modern art, let's say Picasso or T.S. Eliot, uh, the reason it works when it does is that the people who are doing it are such geniuses that they're able to come up with their own set of rules and follow them so that what they create is organic and it speaks to you. It's not, you know, Shakespeare was a genius within the context of, um, was it dactylic hexameters? No. Um, pentameter, I don't know. I can't remember the exact verse structure that he used, but he played within that rule, that, that, those rules. Mm -hmm. And moderns abolish those rules. And you can do that if you're, if you're Picasso or if you're T.S. Eliot. But if you're not that talented, you know, it's a mess. It's not that interesting. So because you don't really have anything consistently that you're pushing up yourself against to define what you're doing, to, to, to be accountable to, to the process. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, no. and that's why ultimately so many horror movies and horror properties just aren't interesting to me because, you know, there's no, you know, just showing terrible things happening to people, even if they sort of have it coming, isn't that interesting to me? It might be interesting once, but otherwise after that, it's like, uh, you know, show me something more interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, um, speaking of rules, we're going to be having a raffle because Jim Harberson has given us two signed copies of his latest book, uh, Cor Comorbidities, and um, you'll be able to enter that raffle at the bottom of this uh, podcast, um, uh, at the bottom of the transcript. So uh, be sure to enter to win one of these two signed copies um, and we're going to ship that to anyone in the United States and we'll be taking entries until the, the date is going to be until October 26th. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm glad. I hope that the people who win them enjoy them because, you know, this is this, you know, being able to, I, I'm so grateful to my publisher, Marcosia, being able to write, you know, create stories and have them be published and appreciated by people is such a magnificent, it's magical in a way. I mean, that's a trite expression, but it, it applies, right? So, you know, being able to reach people, I have, you know, people, some people don't get what I'm up to at all, and that's fine. You know, it's art. What can you do? But some people really get it. And it's always it's so gratifying when, when people read what I've written and they really understand and they lo they love it. Yeah. And this and just came out um, like June 1st months ago. Yeah. Yeah. And um, oh, did you want to talk about what you're working on now? Or are you allowed to talk about what you're working on now? Or? I'm trying to <laughs> I'm working on three novels. right? Now. One of them I've. I've largely outlined and I'm in the process of writing it. One of them I've outlined, I haven't started writing it yet. The other one's in the in the brainstorming phase. Okay. And mm -hmm. the one I'm writing, I'm just gonna say it's about identity and the, the fracturing of identity. Mm. Because I, I, I think that that is something that's happening in our society right now. You know, people define themselves who they wanna be, right? But yeah, that goes people, back to what you were saying earlier about people's personas online and on social media versus what they're really like. And and I'm sure, I think a lot of people, and this is also part of the human condition, don't know who they are. And they're looking to find out who they are. It's And it's something that everybody does, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd actually be kind of scared of people who never asked who they were and tried to define themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, because they've been programmed, essentially. Uh, and And so it's... But the thing is, is that the ability of people to represent themselves in all kinds of ways that they weren't able to before, um, it's interesting, but it, you know, it's one of those things that could lend itself to horror. I mean, look at catfishing, for example. Right? Mm -hmm. 
And that's been going on for a long time. People can manufacture whole identities and realities online that are completely fictitious and induce other people to get involved. So, I mean, every just check your spam folder on, on Instagram or Twitter, right? You know, mm. I am, you know, you get this thing. It's like, I am a beautiful so-and-so and, you know, I will send you, I will send you nude photos or whatever if you send me money, you know, and it's like, it's probably in, on some server farm or, or hacker farm in, in Eastern Europe or something. And uh, people just make money doing this. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that's to me, that's really interesting because it takes the ability of people to be ambiguous about who they are or completely to falsify who they are and to exploit other people with them. So. Well, speaking of social profiles and reality, how can we find the real Jim Harbison online? Well, Mike, the clearinghouse is jamesharberson.com. That's Mm -hmm. just J-A-M-E-S-H-A-R-B-E-R-S-O-N, you know, dot com. And you can find links to all of my books, my socials, et cetera, on there. Um, My books are available at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, bookstores all over the world. And if you're looking for me on socials, I'm on Instagram and on uh, and I'm on Twitter as well. Um, and you can you can access those through my website. Um, I think it's at stay at stay alive GN on on uh, Instagram and stay alive graphic actually i don't remember i'd have to look up the twitter um can you provide that in the uh oh absolutely (laughs) in the uh there we go provide that in the in the notes absolutely i i actually have your uh instagram on my phone here it's it's stay alive gn yeah which is what you said and then uh i'll have to look up what your twitter was because i don't remember it either (laughs) Instagram is probably the best way to. Yeah, to it stay seems in like touch that's where you. you're most active, and that's where yeah. I've mostly had contact with you. So. <laughs> yeah, Instagram is it's a lot. The place to be. <laughs> so, I I mean it's I am just I'm there for the memes. There, there there's so much genius out there that finds expression now in ways that you couldn't before. There's so many artists and people that I who I would never even meet and they put their stuff on Instagram and it's just endlessly amusing and refreshing. Yeah. (laughs) Social media gets a lot of flack and some of it's deserved, but people under, you know, people don't understand that it really does connect people in utterly unforeseeable ways for the good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how I met you. It is. (laughs) So I'm going to put in a plug for your, your logo. With the oh. ant wearing the 3D glasses. I think that's one of the coolest <laughs> things I have ever seen. Oh, thank so, you. Props um, for that. Yeah, my, my friend Heather Landry, um, Sandpaper Daisy, uh, designed our logos and mascots. Be sure to check her out, too. Sandpaperdaisy.com. <laughs> so, well, like Any... I... Like, go ahead, sorry. Oh, just I was going to ask if you had any final thoughts and, you know... Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to talk Mm -hmm. about my work. Oh, uh, yeah, no problem. (laughs) And and indulging me my long-windedness. I guess that, you know, I I just like to say I'm grateful that I have a forum, that I can talk to people, that I can put out there my my experiences, my ideas, and that, you know, I'm grateful people have found them and, and enjoyed them. And... You know, it, it's difficult to ask for. I was talking about people getting what they want, and and I didn't know what I wanted growing. I, I'm finding that I really do like this, and that I'm, you know, grateful that I'm able to communicate with people about things I love and and reach them in a way that that they enjoy and I enjoy. So you know, just thank you to you, thank you to my publisher, thank you to my fans. You know. <laughs> I hope I can continue to reach people with my work going forward. So. <laughs> well, thank you for my signed copy, and thank you for these two that 
are going to be raffled to um, horrorfam.com readers or listeners and yeah be sure you sign up to to get one of these um and we'll be choosing a winner on october 26th <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show jim harberson <laughs> thank you very much and have a great evening thank you you too bye